Hello and welcome to the next episode. Thank you for tuning in. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Nathan Bryan. Dr. Nathan is an international leader in molecular medicine and nanotech oxide biochemistry. And he has been on this podcast for the second time already. First time it was a year ago, so if you missed it, go listen to it. The link is in the description. To recap from the previous episode, nitric oxide is a very important molecule that is naturally produced in our body, but the problem is that there are lifestyle factors that hinder the production of nitric oxide. Therefore, it has been linked to cardiovascular health, sexual and mental health, as well as popular as sports supplements. You have probably heard about beetroot extract. In this episode, Dr. Brian talks about the importance of nitric oxide for prevention and treatment of virus infections like COVID-19 or coronavirus. We also mention how to test if you produce enough nitric oxide. And then Dr. Brian tells you what you can do to support your own body in production of nitric oxide and therefore stay healthy. Without further ado, here is Dr. Nathan Bryan. Well, thanks, Daniel, for having me back. It's hard to believe it's been a year since we first uh, met and discussed nitric oxide. You know, this field moves relatively quickly. There's, I think, now over 175,000 175, published papers in the scientific literature. So what hasn't changed is, you know, the importance of nitric oxide in health and in medicine. Uh, what has changed is we're beginning to understand the importance of nitric oxide outside of sports performance in cardiovascular medicine. And so now in this time of this uh, viral uh, epidemic or pandemic, we're understanding the importance of nitric oxide in our own immune function. And so I think it's relevant now that, you know, with the coronavirus, the people that are getting sick, uh, 50% of the people that have passed due to the coronavirus have high blood pressure and poor circulation and compromised immune function. And so what this tells us is that these people are really deficient in nitric oxide. And it makes sense to me because you need nitric oxide for health and and well-being and disease prevention. So it's been known for many years that people with poor circulation are more prone to infections. There's a number of reasons for that. So if you can't uh, get blood flow and oxygen and activate your immune cells to a site of infection or where either viruses or bacteria have uh, taken up residence and begin to replicate, multiply, then your body can't fight it. And so really the importance of immune function is being able to mobilize immune cells, which is basically increasing circulation. And you can't do that without nitric oxide. So in these patients who are at risk or increased susceptibility to infections, they become deficient in nitric oxide. So what we're finding is that if you can restore the production of nitric oxide or give these patients nitric oxide, you can fortify their system and basically take at-risk patients and make them more resistant to either becoming ill from viral infections or obviously succumbing to death from these viral infections. So to me, it should be the frontline therapy for this whole worldwide epidemic. In fact, there are a number of companies that are fast-tracking inhalative nitric oxide therapy uh, for this particular reason. And so that, that's really what's new. And it's, you know, sometimes it takes crises and, and uh, these uh, fear-based approaches to really bring to light what's important to combat these very serious health challenges. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. And actually, um, now that you are speaking about the importance of nitric oxide for basically resisting infections and what role it plays in it. Um, Do you think that it's something, you know, like we have supplements, like everybody is speaking about vitamin C, uh, maybe like omega-3s and selenium, zinc and uh, other supplements to boost your immunity. Nobody has ever spoken about (laughs) nitric oxide until now uh, that I have you. And uh, do you think that this supplement or supplementing the nitric oxide right now uh, would be beneficial? And do we have any research based on that? To support well, we that? do. I, I truly believe it, it would be beneficial because the science tells us this. And 
2005, there was studies come out showing that nitric oxide actually inhibits coronavirus replication. So once people are exposed to it and it takes up residence, if your body can elicit an immune response or, or you expose the, the virus to nitric oxide, it basically you inhibit its replication. So you inhibit the proliferation and the replication of the viral particle and prevent people from getting sick. And so we know the science is there. We know that nitric oxide is part of our innate immune response. And so if you subject these uh, patients to a nitric oxide donor, something that actually releases nitric oxide gas that would recapitulate the conditions uh, as published in that study, then we know that you can inhibit viral particle replication. Um, so the science is there. The, the question now becomes, does this translate into humans? Because there's been no human clinical trials on giving a nitric oxide donor or nitric oxide-based technology once the patient gets sick, can you alleviate the symptoms, prevent the respiratory distress and the respiratory failure that typically uh, these people suffer from? So that's the question. And I think what's important is that one, nitric oxide become a primary conversation piece around nitric oxide, around uh, the coronavirus. It's not antibiotics or uh, chlorhydroquinone as they're saying in the news. It's, it's much more than that. We have to fortify our body with nitric oxide, increase blood flow and circulation to elicit a robust immune response and let our body do what it's designed to do. So I think just as vitamin C and zinc and all these things that you mentioned are important because they're necessary for normal immune function, uh, probably more important is the discussion around nitric oxide. Nobody's talking about that. I think that is probably the number one protection you can have against not just coronavirus, but even the seasonal influenza or even bacterial infections. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, that was actually the question that I had in mind when you started speaking about it, that uh, what else it could be like uh, good for protection. And uh, in the last episode, we also were speaking about um, like blood pleasure. <laughs> pleasure. Uh, blood pressure and CVDs basically and now we are delving into uh, I would say it would play a beneficial role in uh, prevention of all virus infections is that right? That is correct. So I think what what's important to, what's new is that you know if we go back to the to the basics of what nitric oxide is it's a signaling molecule it's how cells in the body communicate with one another. So it was first discovered its importance in the cardiovascular system. It's how you dilate blood vessels, increase blood flow and oxygen delivery. But it's, you know, people forget that it's a neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. It's how our uh, central nervous system and nervous system works. Uh, and also how our immune system functions. And so when we get an infection, part of the body's response is to upregulate uh, nitric oxide producing enzyme that generates a lot of nitric oxide for a short period of time. It kills off bacteria, so it, uh, mechanisms well elucidated that it binds to the iron sulfur centers of bacteria and shuts down the respiration. And then also in viral infections, it basically prevents the replication and proliferation of the viral particles. So again, your body's ability to make nitric oxide and produce nitric oxide really determines how healthy you are not just in performance of, of well-trained athletes and being able to perform at the top of the game, but just for the normal individual who wants to maintain health and wellness and, you know, prevent these infections, whether viral or, or, or bacterial. So there's nothing more important in my mind of being in this field for more than 20 years now that the number one thing you can do to increase your health and wellness and basically keep safe from infections is to normalize your nitric oxide production. And again, if you, if you give the body what it needs, the body does its job and heals itself and protects us from infection. Yeah, that's amazing. And actually, actually I see that's uh, something that's good with this situation, that people started paying more attention to their nutrition. They started paying more attention to ways how they can improve their immune system and so on. The only downside that I see is that they haven't been doing it or they hadn't been doing it before. But, well, any time is better than no, never. And 
Yeah, I agree. You know, human nature is, is funny in the fact that people typically don't take action until there's fear. Humans are fear-based, reactive beings where it should be, you know, we should be proactive and do the things we're supposed to do because here's what we know. Everything that we know the past several hundred years that allows longevity to keep us healthy, free from infections and functioning optimally in cardiovascular health and immune function, whether it's a good diet, moderate physical exercise, uh, moderate sunlight, infrared light, infrared sauna, sweating, all that basically generates nitric oxide. So mechanistically, we know that everything that we've been told for many, many years that we know that people just don't do revolves around restoring the production of nitric oxide. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we speak about the importance of nitric oxide in uh, now, like uh, yeah, people are interested in how do we uh, boost our immune system? How can we prevent spreading or catching this disease or let's say any virus infection? Maybe they even train, you know, and train hard like athletes right now. So you mentioned you believe that it is the most important way how to basically pro protect yourself besides like vitamin C and good diet and overall good lifestyle and maybe like you know washing your hands and isolating yourself so uh, how much or could we quantify like compared to, for example all these other things like vitamin C and so on uh, from the nutritional perspective how much does nitric oxide or supplementing with nitric oxide uh, would be beneficial or you know compared to all these other things yeah well that's a good question it's a very difficult question to answer because there's a number of nitric oxide supplements or i should say there are a number of products that have a nitric oxide marketing claim on them. there's only one technology in the world that actually delivers on nitric oxide and i have I think, 23 or 24 issued u.s international patents So we know how to make nitric oxide. So just because a product says that it has nitric oxide on the label or that it's a nitric oxide supplement doesn't necessarily mean that it generates nitric oxide. In fact, 99% of those products out there don't work. And we've quantified this, we've tested it, uh, we've verified the ones that do and the ones that don't. But let me just get back to probably a more fundamental question is, you know, how do you, what's the best way to improve your nitric oxide? There's two considerations. Number one, you've got to stop doing things that are inhibiting the body's own production of nitric oxide. And then number two, you've got to give the body what it needs to generate nitric oxide. And so let me go back to the first question. So the first point, that it's been shown that using antiseptic mouthwash or antibacterial soaps or chronic use of antibiotics kill the good bacteria. And there are bacteria that live in and on our body that part of their responsibility is to generate nitric oxide. So in the U.S., we have about 200 million people that wake up every morning and use an antiseptic mouthwash. It's about almost two-thirds of the population. And so that shows that if you use mouthwash, your blood pressure goes up. If you use mouthwash, you lose the cardioprotective benefits of exercise. And so that's number one. If you use a mouthwash, you have to stop because it's disrupting your body's own ability to make nitric oxide. I think antibiotics are obviously important, but not for chronic use. You put on a regimen of antibiotics, kill the infection, then get off and then you know, take some probiotics to restore the, the good floor that the antibiotics kill. So that's number one. Then number two is antacids. You know, taking antacids, things like proton pump inhibitors for uh, reflux disease, has been shown to inhibit nitric oxide production. So you've got to stop taking those if you're taking them. And so those are the things that we know that are really profound at disrupting the body's ability to make, to make nitric oxide. And then the consideration is, what do you need to produce nitric oxide? Well, we know that you can get it through eating green leafy vegetables and the or inorganic nitrate, nitrite that's found in these, can, the body can then utilize to make nitric oxide. But again, eating vegetables only works if you have the right oral bacteria. And then number two, you've got to figure out, most people are deficient in magnesium. Magnesium is an essential cofactor for producing nitric oxide exercise improves endothelial function so the enzyme that makes nitric oxide in the lining of the blood vessels actually can become active um, and then as you mentioned you can take a nitric oxide uh, supplement that 
in, in, in our philosophy and doing this for over 20 years is in developing uh, commercial technology is that if your body can't make nitric oxide, then we have to do it for you. And then number two, we've got to fix the reason your body can't make nitric oxide. So that technology, which is the basis of my more than two dozen issued patents, does just that. So we make nitric oxide in the human body that basically recapitulates what your body would normally do. Uh, but if you can't make it for whatever reason, there's some genetic predispositions, poor diet, lack of physical exercise, using mouthwash, all these things we talked about, then this technology does it for you. But then number two, if you subscribe to these things that we teach you and stop doing the things that are disrupting and do the things that promote, then your body's ability to generate nitric oxide can actually improve. And that's the ultimate goal, was let your body do what it's designed to do. And when you do that, you know, the, the body takes care of itself. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to, let's say, general population, are there any people who are like more predisposed to uh, maybe have problems with converting nitric oxide from food or uh, have any like lower production or something like this? Are there maybe some other medications that interfere with that or uh, maybe some genetic factors? Yeah, there's all of those are important considerations. <clears throat> so take this step by step. So inorganic nitrate which is found in beetroots and some beetroot products, and naturally in beets and green leafy vegetables. So nitrate is inert in humans, meaning that humans cannot metabolize this molecule. So for instance, if you take a beetroot product, number one, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's nitrate in it, but 90% of the beetroot products out there have zero nitrate. So it has no effect on performance. Although a lot of people are buying beetroot powders and drinking beetroot juice, they get no benefit from it. So that's number one. Number two, then you have to have the right bacteria to, to metabolize the nitrate molecule into nitric oxide. And so if people are using mouthwash, uh, it kills these bacteria. If people have active oral infections, these bad bacteria outcompete the good bacteria and they lose the ability to generate nitric oxide. Uh, and this is from asymptomatic infected root canals or even gingivitis, periodontal disease these people become nitric oxide deficient. So that's where that's kind of the first step in the process. So number one, if you're not eating enough green leafy vegetables, and number two, it even, it's even more complicated because we published a study back in 2014, I think, that shown that you know, even among the same vegetables here in the US, there may be a 50 fold difference in the amount of nitrate found in celery or spinach or broccoli from New York, Chicago to LA all across the U.S. because of the changes, the differences in farming practices in that. So just because you're eating vegetables doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting enough nitrate to affect nitric oxide production. Same thing, you could be buying a commercial bee powder uh, that doesn't contain any nitrate, so you're not gonna get a benefit from it. So that's the first step. Then number two, as I mentioned, you have to have the right oral bacteria. Or if you get gingivitis, periodontal disease, oral infections, then you don't have those right bacteria. So this is a very complicated process that most people don't understand, appreciate. They just do these simple things like drinking beetroot powder and thinking they get a benefit. But again, 95% of these people are getting no benefit because of disruptions in this pathway or the fact that the, the product you're taking has no inorganic nitrate or nitrate. Yeah, that's all interesting. And uh, what about testing for nitric oxide? Are there any tests that people can take or anything like that? Yeah, that, that's been a problem. And, you know, we recognized that over 10 years ago, it's because people didn't know what, number one, what nitric oxide was, or number two, why they needed to take a nitric oxide product, because there was no test to tell them whether they were deficient or replete in nitric oxide. And so I developed a salivary test strip, I guess probably 10 years ago now, and you can apply your saliva to the end of this test strip and it'll change color. So if it turns a dark pink, then you know that your body has what we call total body nitric oxide availability. Uh, but if it doesn't turn, if it, may, it stays white, then that tells us that your body is deficient in nitric oxide. But it doesn't tell us why you're deficient in nitric oxide. And so we, we can then begin to interrogate 
certain steps in this process and figure out exactly what's going on. But the, uh, the kind of a limitation is that is there's false positives. So people with an active oral infection will show all the signs and symptoms of complete nitric oxide deficiency, but they'll turn this test strip bright pink, uh, and that's basically due to an immune response in the oral cavity, and it really has no uh, diagnostic or prognostic utility in terms of total body nitric oxide production. Because systemically, these patients are nitric oxide deficient. It's just that they've, their immune system is activated in their oral cavity, which shows up in their saliva. So I think it's a good tool to have in your toolbox, but it's not uh, completely definitive in terms of determining nitric oxide status. There are some uh, medical devices that are on the market that are FDA cleared here in the U.S. and I think even worldwide that can determine the functional production of nitric oxide, or what we term as endothelial function. And these are devices that are very useful and can give people a sense of kind of their vascular health. And I think it's important that people get a sense of this before, you know, the, the consequences of cardiovascular disease and vascular dysfunction that occur later in life. Because it's known that when you lose the ability to generate nitric oxide in the blood vessels, this kind of loss of nitric oxide production precedes the structural changes by many years, sometimes decades. So the point is that if you, if you, if you can get a sense of your vascular function, when it begins to start to decline, and you employ these strategies to prevent the further decline and restore its production, then you can prevent the structural changes that occur in the lining of the blood vessel that cause cardiovascular disease, heart attack, stroke, the number one killer of men and women worldwide. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody is interested in maybe just buying these strips or getting them, uh, where can they get the, those? Now you can Google endothelial function test so there's a, there's a couple of, de of devices out there, and the one that's most effective at showing endothelial function, which we use a technique called venous occlusion plethmosography. So you basically occlude blood flow into the brachial artery for five minutes and then release the cuff, and that gives you, if, you're, if your blood vessels can generate nitric oxide, you can detect a vasodilation downstream of where the occlusion was. Um, and that's from a company called Itamar. They're um, uh, out of Israel. They, they market this device, and it's a very, it's a very effective device for measuring endothelial function. The other, and that, it's a little bit uncomfortable for people because you know their arm starts to tingle because they're not, they don't have blood flow for five minutes. So for some people, it can be uncomfortable, but it's a very effective measure of the body's ability to generate nitric oxide. The other one is a device called the Max. X pulse, which is non-ischemic, meaning that there's no disruption in blood flow, but it's a three-minute test on a fingertip probe, and it'll give you a pretty good readout of vascular structure and function. So the good thing about that is it's it's, it's reimbursable by most insurance companies. There's no discomfort. It's three-minute test, and in that three minutes, you get a lot of information in terms of your overall vascular health. Those are the two that are most commonly used and really give you a lot of good information. So I think these functional tests are much better than a biochemical test. But I think when you use them together, you really begin to paint a pretty good picture of total body health in terms of nitric oxide production. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if somebody just gets into those tests or maybe they uh, are considering that, okay, I might have a some uh, inhibition or deficiency regarding nitric oxide because maybe I'm uh, suffering from uh, having like uh, cavities or I'm already having high blood pressure and so on. So do you know about any doctors or maybe you or practitioners who uh, take could take care of these people and to further maybe facilitate these requests and you know help people to figure out whether or how to uh, how to proceed. Yeah, so I think it is, so. Number one, yes, we do have. We've got 
I don't know, thousands of doctors here in the U.S. that utilize our nitric oxide technology in patient care. But let me take a step back. So the first, and you have to look at the whole picture of the, the clinical picture of the patient. So the first signs and symptoms of nitric oxide deficiency are you start to see an increase in blood pressure or you start to see vascular dysfunction. And vascular dysfunction manifests primarily as erectile dysfunction in both men and women. So when you lose the ability to regulate blood flow to certain tissues upon demand, then that really tells us that you've lost the ability to generate nitric oxide. So these are clinical symptoms that really, in 99% of the patients, demonstrate that it's a nitric oxide problem. But very few physicians worldwide, I mean, we're making some progress now, and I think it's the reason these podcasts are important is to provide education is that you have to start looking at a nitric oxide functionality in this and start employing nitric oxide therapies or strategies in these patients because you can never fix the underlying problem until you fix the nitric oxide production pathways. And so you can, you, number one, you look at the clinical picture of people, physicians use these devices in order to give you really uh, a real picture of nitric oxide production or dysfunction and then rather than putting on prescription medications, let's talk about diet and lifestyle and stop using things that are disrupting nitric oxide production and give your body what it needs to make it. And people get better without drug therapy. And I think that should be the goal of every healthcare practitioner. Yeah, so where can we, where can we move on from there? <laughs> What, what is the future of the nitric oxide? Because you already answered that uh, yeah, there are many products on the market, but like 99% of them are just uh, not worth spending your money on. In the previous episode, you were speaking more about that. So once again, if ever anybody wants to learn more about that, I would uh, urge you to go to that episode. And when it comes to uh, maybe like future, where do you see this being applied? There is, is, it, is there actually uh, maybe a potential for growth or is the industry following in that research in that regard? Well, I think we're, we're on the very early stages of a nitric oxide global awareness, you know, probably where, uh, you know, officials were 30 years ago that I think in you know, 10 to 15 years, nitric oxide will be as common and recognized as vitamin C, as, as fish oils, as vitamin D that people take and recognize and understand they need to take this every day for their overall health and well-being. But I think this is certainly the future of medicine because the healthcare system is crashing in upon itself. And I'll use one good example, and it's high blood pressure. Two out of three Americans have an increase in blood pressure. And that's the number one modifiable risk factor for the development of cardiovascular disease, which is the number one killer of men and women worldwide. And we've known this for 40 or 50 years. And two out of three, or 50% of the people that are on prescription medications, their blood pressure is not affected by these medications. So it tells me that more medicines isn't the problem. Because what we're finding is that people who have high blood pressure may not have uh, a kidney problem or a fluid imbalance, or which is the target for most antihypertensive drugs, but they may have an oral dysbiosis because we know that if you use mouthwash, your blood pressure goes up. So, of course, an ACE inhibitor or a calcium channel antagonist or a diuretic is not going to affect that pathway, so it's not going to affect your blood pressure. We have to fix the nitric oxide production. And so the fact that cardiovascular disease remains the number one killer of men and women worldwide today is for me, it's simply unacceptable because we know what causes cardiovascular disease. It's nitric oxide deficiency. We know how to diagnose it and we know how to detect it. And now there's technology out there to restore nitric oxide production in every single patient, no matter what their underlying problem is, whether it's genetic uh, issues, whether it's proton pump inhibitors, antacids, antiseptic mouthwash, poor lifestyle, they smoke. We know how to generate nitric oxide. In these patients. So I think that's going to be a natural evolution because you cannot ignore the science. 170,000 published papers 
in this field, physicians have to educate themselves, keep up with the um, continuing education in the literature. And so you cannot ignore nitric oxide in patient care. I think that's going to be a natural progression and evolution. And so that's, that's kind of on the, the primary health care side. But to answer your question on you know, these consumer products, that in these lists of products are growing. So as awareness around nitric oxide improves and grows, there's going to be more companies that market nitric oxide products because consumers are looking for these. The important thing, and if I can, if your listeners take one message from this, it's this. Beetroot does not equal nitrate, and nitrate does not equal nitric oxide. So if you're looking for a nitric oxide product and you want the best value for your money, look for two things. Number one, look for patents on these products because if there's patents listed on a nitric oxide product, it tells you that there's been some research and innovation in this product technology that this product does something that no one else can do. Because if there's patents issued, then that tells the basis of patents is you've discovered something that's new, innovative, and never been done before. And if those patents are integrated into that product technology, then you know that uh, there's something to it. And then number two, look for clinical trials. And you can do this, you can search this. And so products, good products that actually deliver on nitric oxide will be able to show an improvement in patients because nitric oxide is such a potent molecule. If a product generates nitric oxide or restores nitric oxide production, they should be able to demonstrate it in randomized controlled clinical trials. Most companies will not put a dietary supplement through a clinical trial because number one, it's very expensive, hundreds of thousands of dollars typically. And number two, most of these products won't move the needle in a clinical trial. So companies are unwilling and probably smartly so to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a clinical trial that's not going to show the results that they want. So they just don't do it. We do the clinical trials because we know how to make nitric oxide. So we've got more than half a dozen to a dozen clinical trials either published or ongoing with our nitric oxide technology at any given time. And so I think those are two important things. If you're looking for nitric oxide products, look for patents and ask the company for any clinical trials that have been conducted on those. And if they can't provide both of those, then save your money because the product does not and cannot work. If it did, they would have that information. All right, that's an excellent advice. And I think that uh, also the market or where I see the most widely being spoken about uh, nitric oxide, it's like beetroot supplements and sports nutrition. So yes, some people are speaking or like you already mentioned, they, they are saying that uh, it's perfect for them, that it uh, gives them some boost to performance. Some athletes have been using it religiously, uh, some are testing it out, some are just being curious right now. Uh, but I think this is actually the group of people that speak about nitric oxide the most. So this could be also one of the ways how it how to get it into like general public, you know, because some people can think that, oh, if it's good for athletes, then it should be also good for me, right? Yeah, I think, look, athletes and well-trained athletes, these are the thought leaders and the makers of, of this. So they're usually the first people to test products. And then, you know, if they like it or they get benefit from it, then they blog or tell others and then it, it kind of goes viral. But that's a completely different population. And in fact, it's a very small portion of the general population. So these, these are the early adopters that understand and appreciate the importance of nitric oxide. And these people are generally healthy anyway because they're active and looking for something that gives them a competitive advantage, whether they're competing as professional athletes or just a weekend warrior looking to you know, optimize their health. So those people get it. They're healthy to begin with. The population that I think probably is most important in getting this information are those that aren't healthy that are sedentary, that are on multiple medications and are at an increased risk for all age-related disease. That entire progression of the rest of their life can be dramatically changed just by restoring nitric oxide production. And it's really that simple. I mean, it's, it's, 
it still surprises me today in this 20 years that one simple molecule can have such a profound effect on many different biological systems and many different people. Yes, yes. And actually, uh, I agree with you that uh, like athletes and especially like these professional athletes, they are just a small percentage of the population, but let's look at it from another perspective that they also uh, are influencers. So, for example, we had Novak Djokovic who went to gluten-free diet, you know, and suddenly there are thousands of people following him. So, yeah, I mean, the influence is clearly there. So, regardless of how their lifestyle is, I mean, People like to copy athletes because they see them as some, you know, like avatars or their role models. So they don't really care or take care to research many things. They just follow what, what they are doing. Yeah, I think, I think you're exactly right. And they're good role models in terms of their physical well-being because they have to maintain optimal performance to compete in their particular sports. And so it's very difficult to subscribe to a one size fits all in you know, what people do. These athletes, it's very hard to replicate what they do because- Well, well I mean, m maybe for you or for people like, or people like us, you know, like uh, we think uh, in a different way because we uh, have a different knowledge, different information, but I think that general population like normal people that's what i'm also doing is educating them look what they are doing is different than what you are doing and what's your lifestyle yep yeah no i i agree but you know these people do things that and one of my favorite quotes is do things today that others won't do so you can do things tomorrow that others can't do and so that that applies to a lot of different facets of life and one is you know living a good life good long life that you're healthy and you're later years and if you don't do the things necessary today to give your body what it needs you're going to suffer later in life and not able to do the things that other people can't whether it's playing with grandkids and playing golf or being active in your 70s and 80s and 90s uh, or not but I think here's what's important is that you can't do this without considering the restoration of nitric oxide that controls blood flow controls vascular health controls how muscles work and perform, uh, how your heart functions, how your brain functions, everything. Yeah, most definitely. So let me ask you this question. Uh, based on all your knowledge that you have gathered over, over the years and the re uh, after all the research that you have done, I mean, it must have had some implication on your lifestyle, on how you eat, how you move, how you think. So how does, or how, how did actually all this research and knowledge influence your lifestyle and your diet? Well, you know, as I mentioned, I've been doing this for 20 years and you can't ignore the science. So I pay attention to what I eat. I pay attention to what I do to make sure that I don't do anything that's disrupting my body's own ability to make nitric oxide. I stay active. Um, so yeah, it, it influences in my family too. We try to you know, practice lifestyle habits that enhance nitric oxide production. We try to eat a clean diet. You know, I live in Texas, I'm 46 years old, but I've got the, using these uh, devices, I've got the vascular system of a young 20 something year old. So I know by listening to my body and actually testing it, that what I'm doing is working and my immune system's robust. I haven't lost a day of work due to illness in probably over 17 years. Uh, so I know this works because I live it, I see it. Uh, and I try to provide these really simple tools and kind of biohacking lifestyle strategies that other people can do. Is it easy? Yeah, you have to, it's not easy. But I think it's worth it if you want to live a good, healthy lifestyle. And so just before we conclude this podcast or this episode, uh, what is actually 
one thing that you would advise to people? I think you already mentioned that, but maybe there is some different advice that you would like to give. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's difficult to give one. Yeah. <laughs> my overall message is that people get sick for two reasons and two reasons only. And if you can distill this down into these two basic concepts, I think it's, it goes beyond nitric oxide. It goes to total body health. But people are sick for two reasons and two reasons only. Number one, their body's exposed to something that they don't need, like some infection or toxin. Or number two, their body's missing something that it needs. And so if you eliminate the bad stuff, put in the good stuff, the body heals itself. And part of what that does is it restores nitric oxide production or prevents its loss. Uh, but it goes way beyond that. And so that simple strategy, if people begin to think in, in those terms, they can get control of their health. And if they've been sick for many years, they can uh, get better or, you know, prevent a lot of these age related illnesses. But that's really kind of the overall message and goes beyond nitric oxide, but really total body health because nitric oxide is important, but it's not, it's not a silver bullet. It's not an end all be all cure all, but there are other things that are affected or there are things that nitric oxide doesn't affect. For example, if you're exposed to mold mycotoxins or heavy metals, then nitric oxide is not going to provide much benefit to you because your body can't utilize it or it's scavenged before it has a chance to do its job. But I think to kind of get back to your question, one, you have to, people need to start, you know, focusing on nitric oxide and doing the things that they need to do to uh, restore the production of this. You can do it through lifestyle or you can do it through some of our patented product technology. So what I actually took from, from your message here is that uh, what, have, what has been advised for long years, like improving your lifestyle, being active, eating healthy food. Uh, yeah, let's focus on that. And nitric oxide is like a good marker of where you are at. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. It's not rocket science. I think if you eat a good balanced, clean diet, get moderate physical exercise, uh, you eliminate toxins, give the body what it needs, and the body heals itself. Yeah, I really love that. So thank you for coming here once again. And I would also like you or this room for you to point people where you want them. So maybe if they want to get in touch with you or, or reach out to you or learn more about nitric oxide, where can they go? I have an educational website. It's drnathansbryan.com. That's D-R-N-A-T-N-S as in Scott, B-R-Y-A-N.com. drnathansbryan.com. I do a monthly blog, so I try to, you know, provide up-to-date practical information on nitric oxide. Uh, there's a couple of really informative videos there so people can learn more about nitric oxide. But it's strictly for educational purposes. I'm not trying to sell you anything. There's no commerce on the side. It's basically just it's free education and information. I think it's probably the most valuable information on the web. Obviously, I have a bias, but um, again, I think people need to understand nitric oxide and really truly appreciate what it can do for the human body. Yeah, definitely. So people will also find this in the description or the summary of the podcast episode and the notes. Also, it will be very easy to go there and reach it. Anyway, thank you very much, Dr. Brian, for reaching out to me and for having this conversation with me again. I hope to hear from you in future and I'm excited about all the stuff regarding nitric oxide that will, you know, catch up with us in the near future. Okay, thank you, Daniel. I appreciate you. Yeah, you have a great day.